It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker for the evening. And that introduction begins over 20 years ago, 1988. A professor here at Iowa State, Dave Hoffman, David Hoffman in the chemistry department, he, he went to a Big 8 meeting. That Big 8 meeting, he learned about a bridge program at the University, the University of St. Louis. At, during that bridge program, he learned about efforts to increase the ethnic diversity of those in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. He brought that idea back to Iowa State and expanded on it, working with some of his colleagues in the Ames Laboratory. He received some initial funding for an idea to increase the number of, increase the number of students from ethnic groups underrepresented in science and technology by starting a program in the middle school area. So they got some initial funding, had five students in a pilot program and worked in Merrill Middle School in Des Moines. And in 1991, they received National Science Foundation funding to start a program, a three-year program. And at that same year, 1991, a young man entered eighth grade at Meredith Middle School in Des Moines. He and nearly 50 other students joined a program called Science Bound, in an effort to get to enhance the creativity and the diversity in technical disciplines. That young man went on to high school at North High School in Des Moines, earned his high school diploma in 1996, and enrolled, having earned a scholarship to Iowa State University, enrolled at Iowa State University in the College of Agriculture. So it's 1991, the young, or 1996, the young man went to school here. 2000, he graduated with a degree in agricultural biochemistry from Iowa State. And having done well, he went on to Cornell University to study plant biology here in his PhD in 2006. And here it is 20 years later, 2011, after some professors had an idea and received some NSF funding. So here we stand today with our keynote speaker for the evening, Dr. Charles Stewart. A generation later, produced a scientist who now works at the Salk Institute, completing a postdoc. He's going to share with us this evening his work and his journey. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Charles Stewart to the podium. Certainly, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for coming out, and especially everyone involved in organizing this um, anniversary event. Uh, I was actually a little, a little bit anxious when, when the offer came because it made me think, have I really been gone from Iowa State that long to come back and give a talk about success and all these other type of things? This is something I, I guess I view as something you do way later in life. Uh, but I was humbled by the invitation. I also like to thank you for waiting, waiting until March. I live in San Diego now, and there's certain months that I don't really like traveling back to Iowa. November, December, January, February, anything and any time when it's freezing out or something like that. Of course, I enjoy visiting my family, but it's always kind of a tug and pull between the weather and the family. Uh, but I'm glad to be here uh, nonetheless. You know, as I was uh, trying to think about what I would you know, talk or try to present to you all today, I try to think back to my days here at Iowa State. I see everyone's looking and laughing. That's me uh, as a freshman uh, at Iowa State. And so I tried to think back, you know, if I could travel back in time magically, uh, what would I say to my undergrad self or to my friends there, the other science-bound students who are on campus, uh, what could I say to them that would kind of help them or spur them on to, to keep advancing and uh, to keep going forward. Uh, and I came up with two things, um, curiosity and creativity. Now, I know it's probably common to talk about hard work, perseverance, you know, living your dreams. Those are all important things and necessary things. Um, but I thought briefly I would share my thoughts on curiosity and creativity um, as it relates to science and living a life 
Uh, this quote here, we come to college not alone to, pre to prepare to make a living, but to learn to live a life. I hope that's familiar to some of you because if it's not, you should make a left here, go out to the stairwell, look up to the right. It's engraved in the Memorial Union um, in, the, in the corridor uh, out there. It's a quote that I saw often as an undergrad here and something that has kind of stuck with me um, over the many years. And so in thinking about curiosity and creativity, I really have thought about these in the context of making a living um, as a scientist, especially for the students um, who are in science or thinking about pursuing a scientific career, um, but also how, to, how these work together uh, to promote how to live a uh, scholarly life. Curiosity is really the fundamental part of, of being a scientist and what education is all about. It's, it's something that's universal, I think, to all people. I, I think everyone has a native, you know, inborn sense of curiosity, of discovering, of, of exploring, you know, asking who, what, where, when, and why. Um, I think you can't really do science if you're not curious, if you don't have a wonder, um, a desire to know more. Uh, curiosity um, really is a wellspring of science. Science emerges out of, I think, our sense of curiosity and trying to discover and make sense of the world around us. Uh, I think back here, I, I, I don't know what year I was, but I was in high school, and I remember being in Science Bound, and probably what I remember the most are on Saturdays, we would have these field trips up to Iowa State, and we would gather, and different faculty members, uh, we would rotate amongst the different buildings, and different faculty members would put up uh, different demonstrations. Um, so, you know, it was everything from biochemistry to chemistry to agricultural uh, engineering, um, et cetera. And I remember what really captivated me um, at the time is being able to go up here on Saturday and really just play, play around and explore all the different areas of science. Because science really is a big area. When someone says they're a scientist, I mean, that's a gigantic statement because that covers a multitude of disciplines. And I think one of the strengths of Science Bound was the fact that it gave students kind of the freedom to explore, uh, explore what they like and explore what they don't like. Now, some people, I think, they're born or, you know, very early on in life, they know what they want to be right away. Some people, they know they want to be a history professor or, you know, they, want, they know they want to be a neurosurgeon or something like this, and they make a beeline you know, straight to whatever, whatever their goal is. And I think that's a good thing if that has happened to you or, or some subject or um, subject matter or content matter has uh, so filled you that you know exactly uh, what you want to do. But I wasn't one of those uh, students. At the time that I graduated, um, I knew I liked science and I knew it was something that interested me enough uh, to pursue it as a major. Um, and I knew I wanted to stay in science and explore this idea of being a scientist, um, et cetera. But I really didn't know specifically um, what I wanted to do. If you would have asked me what a biochemist or an agricultural biochemist is, I, I don't know, I couldn't have told you, or for that matter, what a chemical engineer is or, and all of this. And furthermore, if you would have asked me outside of books or when I was in class, what is it that a chemist or a chemical engineer, or for that matter, a mathematician, what do they do on an everyday basis, I wouldn't have been able to tell you. So to the students, I would say one great thing or opportunity you should pursue is try to get involved in actually doing science or experiencing science for what it is, um, the actual practice of doing science, of making hypotheses, of designing experiments, of, of seeing what it's like when your experiments work and seeing what it's like when they often don't work. Uh, that is a side of science that I think probably people aren't familiar with is that things probably don't work 80% of the time. And uh, it's figuring out how to get it to work right that you actually spend, up, spend most of your time doing. So as an undergrad, um, I first did an, an internship with Dr. Sandy McNabb. Uh, at that time, I think it was the Department of Forestry and Plant Pathology that's kind of since um, been renamed a few times. And I had a great experience there. Uh, at the same time, I realized that's kind of, that, that wasn't really what was calling me or that didn't really um, stir me intellectually. And I think that's important for the students to realize uh, that sometimes finding out what you don't want to do is just as important as finding out what you want to do. Uh, and so there's nothing wrong, I think, with experimenting and exploring a new area and after, you know, a certain period of time saying that, you know, um, I gave it my best, but this just isn't, um, this, this just isn't for me. And I don't think there's any guilt or anything wrong with that. So after I worked with 
uh, Dr. McNabb um, for a spell. I began a, uh, with an internship and I, through the year a series of undergraduate research, uh, uh, an undergraduate research position uh, with uh, Professor Parag Chitnis. Uh, he's now at the National Science Foundation, uh, but at that time he was a professor in the biochemistry department. And there, so to speak, I, I, I guess you could say I kind of found a home. Uh, at that time, we were exploring bacteria, but more importantly, photosynthetic bacteria and pigments that these bacteria make. And what I really learned or got involved with is that these pigments have medicinal uses, but they also have uh, an importance in agriculture. Uh, for instance, uh, in plants, they help reduce um, photooxidation that often happens during photosynthesis. Um, and some of these pigments, such as carotenoids, uh, you may be familiar with probably more from carrots, but carotenoids have a big health of benefit for their antioxidant um, capabilities. And so that area of research of uh, what's commonly called secondary metabolism or plant natural products, I, I found really interesting. Um, and another experience I had, um, I had an opportunity to do a series of, of industry internships with uh, Dow AgroSciences. It's a large agricultural, um, somewhat biotech company now. And that, that was a really great experience because I got to see science being applied to everyday problems. I think one of the things when you're exploring is that you, you learn that there are many sides to science. There's, there's basic science and then there's applied science. Some of the, when you're doing applied science, you're working directly on problems as they relate you know, to, the, to people, you know, hunger, uh, food production, food quality. Um, all, all of these things um, have an immediate benefit to society. Of course, when you're doing basic research, uh, sometimes um, you're a couple steps removed from the actual application. It's not that what you're doing doesn't have applications, it's that there might be a few steps you need to go to um, before you get there. So it's a little more distant um, from it. And so doing basic science, um, both in um, Dr. Chitnis's lab and in some of my um, later experiences, we study questions such as evolution and how these natural products, uh, where do they come from? Um, why are they in certain plant species, not in others? Um, and, and, and et cetera, and I'll talk about those in a few slides. But also being in Dow AgroSciences, um, it gave me a, the added perspective that most of my research uh, as an undergrad, all of my experiences were lab-based. So I worked in the lab of Dr. Sandy McNabb. I worked in the lab of Dr. Parag Chitnis. Uh, when I got to go to Dow AgroSciences, I had several opportunities to do what they call field work in agriculture, being out in the field where the plants are actually grown. And, uh, and it gave me a different perspective because I think, um, at least I can say this within agriculture, one of the challenges is to connect what we do in the lab, the experiments that we do in the lab, and connect it to the field work, agronomy, so to speak, what's done in the field. And the challenge really is how to bridge those two um, together. So, you know, I, that's what I really took from my undergraduate experiences, uh, is, that, is that exploring, and at the end of it, I found a general area of this plant natural products or secondary metabolism um, that, I really, um, that I really liked. Then I moved on to grad school. The most important thing I learned in grad school is to ask questions. Uh, I know, obviously, research is important, and your techniques that you learn are important, but your techniques, uh, they always change. Uh, the techniques that I learned in grad school, I graduated from Cornell University in 2006, and most of the techniques I learned in grad school, a lot of them, um, it's, it's all changed. What was considered standard, or should I say top-notch then, is now kind of considered standard, and so those all change. And because techniques change, you can never really master all the techniques that are out there. Um, but the heart of science is asking questions, moving forward. And of course, we've all heard the saying that there are no stupid questions, and that is something I firmly believe. But some questions are more important than other questions. You can have big questions about how the universe came about, or how are you going to, how are you going to attain climate change, uh, et cetera. And those are all big questions and worthy of serious discussion and consideration. However, oftentimes in science, especially at the grad school level, you'll need to break those questions down into something that you can test or you can get data for. Uh, you can't write a dissertation if you don't have data. Um, you can write a good introduction, uh, but everything else will be um, relatively blank. So learning to ask questions and learning to ask the right questions, the relevant questions, uh, get to the heart of the matter. Uh, you know, you, there are some questions that can get you right, that are critical and get, can get you right to where you need to go and others kind of wander about. And so that's a skill that 
I don't think you learn one time. It's something that comes with practice, and it's something that I still work on practicing um, every day. So uh, in grad school, I started working uh, with proteins, uh, specifically proteins from plants that made these um, enzymes, or excuse me, made these natural products. Um, after grad school, I kind of continued on a similar path, except for instead of looking at it from a genetic perspective, so looking at how genes are inherited, I started to look at it from a structural perspective. That is, uh, proteins are made of building blocks called amino acids, and when they are put together, they kind of form interesting shapes um, three-dimensionally. Uh, they form spirals and sheets and all these other things that make a protein um, artwork in, in many respects. But one of the things I started working on um, is a protein that we found um, in, apple, in apple trees. And this protein actually makes a chemical that fights fungus and keeps fungus at, at bay. And so we became very interested in, in understanding uh, and trying to understand if we can un trying to understand the structure of this protein um, because many a times, and I'm sure the students would know this, that many a times the structure and the function of a protein, or for that matter of a chemical, are, re are related to each other. So if you know the structure, you can start to get an understanding or a grasp of its function. And so this is a protein that uh, we were able to solve the structure for. And um, once we have the structure, of course, we don't just look at one, uh, one protein. We like to compare it to others. And so in, in thinking about protein structure and protein function, uh, you like to look at if, what are the changes in structure that happen between different proteins, and can you relate that to changes in the function of a protein? So for example, uh, if we, uh, we took a, the protein from apple and compared it to similar proteins from grape and, and alfalfa, and when you look inside the protein, the, the interior of the protein, this is kind of the, where, all the action, where all the action is usually at. When you look inside the protein and you look at the, the specific building blocks, what we can see by comparing these different proteins is that there are small changes, you know, moving from here to here, um, and et cetera. These small changes have a big effect on the final chemical that's being made and ultimately the biological properties of that chemical. So, I mean, we, on in one set of proteins, they make an antifungal co compound that I just talked about. Another protein, great, uh, makes this compound that's, instead of being antifungal, it's, uh, it kills bacteria. And then this, this final set of, uh, this final protein, um, it makes something, it's what I call sunscreen. That is, it's an antioxidant and helps reduce UV damage um, in plants. Uh, and so this was really um, what we were trying to get after and try to understand how these changes um, ultimately uh, result in changes um, in the function and the biological properties um, of these chemicals. And this was a basic research problem, but now that we've answered this, we can now take this and move forward and begin looking at can, the, can, you know, can these chemicals be used, um, for instance, as a biopesticide, or you know, there, there's lots of different ways um, to begin looking at that. So I've talked about curiosity a little bit in the context of doing science, and I'm gonna talk about now creativity. Now, it, it may seem a little odd to talk about creativity um, relevant to science. science. Scientists are usually not known for being, at least not portrayed as being very creative or, um, or anything like that. And I think that's a stereotype that actually does more damage to science than it, than it does good. Because uh, I, I think creativity really comes out of curiosity. If you're curious, um, it's only a small step to being creative. And that is by learning to put, you know, different, connect different dots together, put different pieces uh, together. As I was telling some of the uh, biochem students uh, at dinner t tonight, I work at the Salk Institute, which is named after Jonas Salk. Um, he's credited with coming up with the polio vaccine, uh, which eradicated polio. Uh, but his real contribution wasn't that you know he came up with the he came up with this, um, the vaccine. Vaccines were around for centuries before Jonas Salk started working with them. Uh, and in fact, he was working on the influenza virus and developing a vaccine for influenza. Uh, what, what he really stepped forward, or uh, his big contribution, is that at that time, uh, vaccinations occurred using live viruses. So they would take a live virus, inject it in you, and your body would make antibodies, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to immunize yourself against it. The problem is when you tried that with polio, polio ended up killing, you ended up doing more damage than good. So his contribution really was that 
he learned or he discovered how you can um, attenuate the virus or kill the virus. And, and he used dead, essentially, quote unquote, dead viruses as a vaccine to inject people with. And that was the breakthrough, really, that he used dead viruses. At the same time, um, another scientist discovered a way that you can manufacture or mass produce big, big batches of this virus. So now you know that you can inject a dead virus into a person, and the dead virus won't cause the person to get sick. And now you have a technique for producing massive quantities of the virus. And at that time, he put, put, put it together, and you, know, you get a vaccine um, that worked. So one of the things I've had the um, great experience, a uh, great opportunity to do is I traveled over uh, to Ghana on a uh, research, um, a, a, an experience, research experience trip. And I mean, I, in this experience, I think really tested how you can put, connect different things together. Uh, I was in, a, in an environment that definitely wasn't a laboratory and the problems that we were working on um, required kind of an, an immediate solution um, as best we can. So I went over to northern Ghana, and the, the problem we were working on, there's this plant called Striga. Some of you may be familiar with it because of uh, recently one of the recipients of the World Food Prize um, won this award for de developing a uh, sorghum resistant, uh, excuse me, Striga resistant strain of sorghum. But Striga is a nasty weed. It, it, it infects the plant, and it basically sucks all the nutrients out of the plant, specifically maize. And what you're left with is a, a dead cornfield, essentially. But what, what was really fascinating is to draw connections, being that I had this a basic training in plant biology, and then I'm thrown into this environment where you need to take what you've learned in the textbook and put it together to solve this, this, this problem, and this problem being Striga. Now, we didn't solve Striga. Uh, that is, that's, I was only over there for two months, and that problem is definitely way more than, you know, I was working with a team of about, about five people. That's something way more than we could do at one time. Um, however, we were able to lower the incidence of Striga, so the, the number of times and uh, how bad it was um, in the field. And, um, you know, and that was a great experience. The, the picture here, so there's a picture of a, of a Striga plant. And uh, down here, there's a, uh, I was working with some of the, the farmers, and they're developing a compost bin to do composting. The striga really only infects in um, infertile or soils that have low, um, or low nutrients in them. So the, I, one of the ideas we were working with is if we can increase the soil fertility, that would increase the um, nutrients in the maize plants, and maize can naturally fight striga um, on their own. Uh, and so once again, it was drawing connections from different areas of science um, to put it together to solve a, a problem that was really fascinating. So um, a, a relatively new project that I've uh, had the fortune to start working on um, is actually a collaboration with some scientists uh, kind of headquartered here at, at Iowa State, the Center for Biorenewable Chemical, or CBERC, some of you may have heard. And one of the, the basic premise or idea of this is, is that many chemicals that we use in society today whether it's agriculture or just feed stocks for um, synthesizing chemicals, a lot of them come from the petroleum industry. Obviously, with petroleum, there are lots of problems with that, both politically speaking and the idea that at some point it's not a renewable resource. At some point, this is going to run out. So w there was a question of can we design or um, engineer uh, chemical products to come from renewable resources. And one type of renewable resource um, are plants. Plants make a lot of chemicals. And if we could take some of the chemicals that we have from plants and maybe tinker with them on the enzyme, tinker with the plant protein, maybe we can have chemicals um, that can begin replacing some of the chemicals that we normally get uh, from petroleum. So the, the, the question we, um, I began to work on is if I take this, this protein uh, called biphenylsynthase, it's the same protein I showed you earlier from apples. Uh, if I take that protein and begin to tinker around with it, if I showed you all the, the building blocks and subunits er, earlier, but if I can begin to tinker around with it, you know, can we take it from making the, this top chemical, which is the, the pesticide that kills um, fungus, can we tinker with it and maybe make this um, bottom chemical, which can serve as a feeder um, or a chemical to be used to make a whole array of other chemicals, such as adhesives um, and polymers um, and et cetera. And so once again, this, this involves taking many different disciplines, engineering and chemistry and 
you know, towards the later end, uh, the later stages, you know, you have marketing involved and, and, and all of that. And I think one of the really creative challenges is first we all have to work together, which is always a big challenge because you have people that are coming from vastly different areas and now we have to work together on the same project. But also to accomplish that, that takes insight from all the groups. You know, it's not enough if we're able to make this in a lab, but later on down the road, the engineers say we can't scale this up to something that can be commercial. So it's been, it's been very interesting to get that feedback and to tinker and you change your experiments and kind of evolve the project um, accordingly. So I've, I've talked mostly about making a living um, as a scientist. And I'm just going to conclude with a few remarks about um, how to live a life um, or making, uh, excuse me, living a life. Obviously, there's great change going on in the world today. I mean, you can look at globalization, you, uh, unemployment, um, climate change. There's, there's big changes going on in the world today. And to the students, I would say to you, curiosity is so important, that insatiable desire for knowledge to keep on learning. It's important not only here at Iowa State while you're working to get your degree, but it's an important trait to have throughout your life as you begin to leave the university system. I think one of the worst things that can happen is to leave a university system and to think that your education is over, that you, that you stop learning. In fact, you really are just you, commencement. It's the beginning. Commencement means to begin. Commencement is really the beginning of, of your journey. So Eric Hoffer, a, a writer and philosopher, has a quote that I, that I really love. It says, in a time of drastic change, it is the learners who inherit the future. The learned usually find themselves equipped to live in a world that no longer exists. And with so much going on today, in science, techniques change so rapidly. In the world, things change so rapidly that if you don't adapt, if you don't keep learning, you end up very well prepared for a world that doesn't exist anymore. Um, time, the world, um, it all moves on. And so one of the challenges to the students and really to everyone is to keep learning. But it's not just for science sake, it's also imperative for the sake of society. I mean, being a good scientist is also, I think, um, related to being a good citizen. With, I'm sure I don't have to tell everyone about all the budget cuts going on in the state and on a national level, but having an analytical mind or a scholarly mind to ask, you know, are they doing the right thing? Is this the only way, you know, is cutting education the only way to solve this problem? I'm not saying it is, and I'm not saying it's not, but the question needs to be asked and thought about um, analytically and critically. And I think this is something that we all can do. In essence, we all can be scientists. And of course, mentioning creativity, uh, as I mentioned, I think it's a big myth that scientists aren't creative or something like that. And I think um, science and art are really two sides of the same co coin. They, they feed each other. Um, and I think many scientists that I know of, they, they find that the, their art or their creative exercises um, really rejuvenate them to do the science that they want. And um, I started looking, uh, looking through the literature and trying to think back to courses and um, kind of anecdotes I had and looked up. And in fact, you'll find, I think, that many prominent scientists, uh, they have an artistic side. So we have Albert Einstein, the great physicist. You know, he was a very well um, an accomplished um, violinist. George Washington Carver, which I obviously um, here at Iowa State everyone's familiar with, um, he was a painter and had fabulous drawings that I, I know they have collections of here at Iowa State. Uh, a guy that I had a chance to meet and uh, hear speak, Dr. Neil De, uh, deGrasse Tyson, uh, he's an astrophysicist. Uh, he may be more well known today. He was one of the leading proponents of changing Pluto from a planet um, to a, I, I think they call it a subplanet or you know something uh, like this. Uh, but uh, during his grad school days, he was a, uh, an accomplished um, ballroom dancer. So I think that science and art really go hand in hand. And I would tell the students, if you have a creative side, um, obviously you, can, you may not be able to do it every night or something like that. But if you have something that you cherish and that's creative, um, you should keep it and try to nurture it and let it nurture your science to keep moving forward. And as for myself, I figured I would give you all a, a demonstration. Hot sauce so one more time, Charles and Elena, everybody.
Three shots. Multiple shots. Can you do it? Work. Хорошо танцует для трех недель. I think the split still had me sore a little bit. <laughs> at least when I look at it, <laughs> it makes me sore. Um, so really, my last statements are uh, to the students uh, and, and to the faculty, to really let your cur curiosity and creativity be an asset to your science. Let it lead you on to new and higher heights. Uh, I know that I was telling some of the students, during, when you're doing research on the undergrad level or on the grad, graduate school level, I know there are times when things are going slow and you feel like quitting and you spend weeks, sometimes months, and it just seems like, you know, things aren't working, working right. But I think it's at those times, if you let your curiosity and creativity come through, they'll help you get over those obstacles, over those roadblocks um, in your way. And my final thought is that when you think about it, all of us in here are unique. There is no one in this room um, identically like each other. And for that matter, if we think about all of history and all, all the future, however long that is, there's no one that's going to be 100% exactly like you. So because of that, I think it's upon each of us to cherish our curiosity and, and our creativity because it's our individual curiosity and our individual creativity that, we, uh, that are our gifts to humanity. Um, so thank you, ScienceBound, for bringing me here and inviting me back. Um, it's, it's been 20 years, it's kind of hard to believe. Um, but you know, the program has changed so tremendously with so much growth, and I look forward to connecting, staying connected with the students and the faculty and seeing ScienceBound uh, celebrate its 40th. Thank you very much. Oh, no. Are there questions? Or... Oh, I don't have to, or I can. Oh, um, if there are questions, I, I would be happy to answer any. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, I currently have to talk the protein structure that I showed you. Um, I work in the structural biology group, and we look at the, um, the three-dimensional structure of proteins and relate that to its function, so the structure and function relationship. Many of these proteins make um, compounds um, that affect um, agricultural productivity. Um, and so that's what, that's, that's what I work on. Right, so um, he asked, oh, he, he's kind of stated first that obviously I only talked about one protein, one enzyme. Most of these are involved in more complicated metabolic pathways, and so, you know, just changing one may not necessarily change everything, which is a true statement. And then his, uh, his question was about, you know, how do you know which, for instance, amino acids to change to get the um, product that you want? Um, so we actually, we don't just change one uh, amino acid. We, we'll usually start out um, changing five, six um, different amino acids, and then you know if we have a collection or what's call, often called a library, a library of different proteins or mutant proteins, from that we can test for their you know which ones are making the chemical um, that that we want. Um, also, with the structure, um, and I didn't go go into this uh, with this talk, but with the structure, we don't just solve the protein structure. You solve the protein structure. 
but we also include the substrates or the chemicals that that protein uses to make the products. We include that. And so we get a picture of how the substrate or, or how the chemicals are binding with the protein. Uh, and fr from that, we can get an idea that if we change this part of the protein, it should change the chemical this way. And so th all of these um, give us tips or advice on like which way or which amino acids we should change for that. What's that? Oh, uh, any other questions? <laughs> Okay. Let their wheeze solve protein structures? Oh, uh, yeah, why not? Um, I, mean, um, I mean, solving the protein structure, yeah, there, uh, you have to get the experimental data, et cetera, but uh, there are programs to do this. And, uh, you know, actually, there's a, uh, a gentleman uh, at the University of Washington who has actually written, essentially, it's a game um, where students solve protein structure, and, and those who solve it kind of win the game. Um, and the idea is to hopefully, using this interface, to get some students, you know, who may uh, think of this as something cool to do or, or whatnot. Uh, I, have, I don't see anything conceptually wrong with a student using a Wii or a PS2 or Connect, connect or whatever to... Uh, solve a, a protein structure. <laughs> well, I thank you all for coming and, uh, okay. <laughs>